always kind of a funny thing to uh, present these webinars where I'm speaking to literally hundreds of people through a computer and a speakerphone. Um, welcome to our webinar. I'm going to go through uh, basically what's new uh, in Lucene and solar and why uh, there's uh, so many revolutionary uh, changes that have happened in this technology. Um, we're going to go through things uh, that happened at the solar level uh, that made uh, solar much, much better, uh, sorry, things at the Lucene level that made solar much better, including near real-time support um, and pluggable scoring, faster fuzzy queries, wildcard querying, uh, those sorts of things, um, as well as talk about uh, the, the really advanced features in uh, Solar 4 uh, that many people are investigating and, and, and migrating to uh, as we speak. Um, so uh, here's the high-level takeaways uh, that we broadcast about this webinar. We're going to talk about, uh, again, about solar cloud. Uh, that'll take up a, a good chunk of the time uh, towards the end of the presentation. We're going to see the administrative user interface. We're going to talk about sharding, distributed search, and then we'll talk about uh, many of the other uh, bells and whistles and, and features and capabilities of uh, Lucene and solar. Um, so as we uh, start ramping up in this webinar, um, we're going to have Elizabeth push a poll uh, to everyone so we get a feel for uh, where you're at uh, with this technology. So I'll be back in about 30 seconds uh, after we do the poll. And I'm not sure if I should be seeing the poll or not, but I do not see the poll myself. Polls up. We're getting registrants uh, and we're getting responses. Uh, you're still very actively responding, so I'm going to leave it up just a little bit longer. Um, the options are, uh, in, the question is, which best describes your current situation with regard to Solar 4? And the options for responses are, I'm on an older version and deciding if, when to upgrade. So that would be if you're attending this webinar to learn kind of more about Solar 4 and, uh, and just making sure that you're, you're, you're ready to go. Um, I'm using another search project and I'm considering Solar 4. Uh, so that's a great place for you to be on this webinar to learn all about the new features that are available to you. Uh, and the third option is I'm ready to implement Solar 4, but I want to know more. You want to know your, you want to know that your ducks are in a row before you start moving forward. So it looks like um, about 85% of you have voted. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and show the results. And uh, I might need you to read those results as well, uh, Elizabeth. I don't, I'm not seeing that on my screen. Sure. So 39% of respondents are on an older version and are deciding if, when to upgrade to Solar 4. 23% are using another search project and product and are considering using Solar 4. And 38% are ready to implement, but you want to know more. So that helps us level set and guide the conversation from this point forward. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Very good. And I'll take that information and uh, factor that into uh, where we're moving forward on this. Okay, so let's uh, first start with uh, the, the key feature enhancements uh, that happened uh, in Lucene and Solar at the 4.0 level. Um, and uh, of course, we're going to talk about the, the new uh, Solar Cloud uh, feature as well, or set of features. Um, we're going to start with Lucene. Lucene is the underlying search library that is Solar is built upon. Uh, and it is really the heart of the entire uh, system. It's what makes the search powerful. It's what drives uh, the features such as fasting, spell checking, highlighting, all of these things are driven from the capabilities of Lucene itself. Um, so when Lucene gets better, solar gets better. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of uh, fascinating features at the Lucene level that, that have been developed over the last few years and, and were released in Lucene 4. Flexible index formats. Uh, one of the main takeaways here is this pulsing codec. The pulsing codec allows uh, for improved uh, primary key searches uh, as it inlines, docs, uh, positions, and payloads, saving disk seeks. So uh, this is a great codec. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a TFIDF, uh, term frequency, inverse document frequency, is uh, the primary way that uh, search and retrieval systems uh, historically have worked. 
there are a number of other uh, ways that this stuff can work using the BM25 and the divergence from randomness uh, algorithms there. Uh, support has been built into uh, Lucene to support these. In fact, uh, a, a very big uh, uh, e-commerce uh, retailer that, that I've been working with personally has been uh, giving the BM25 algorithm a try, so they're very happy with this pluggable scoring mechanism. Um, we've also seen faster fuzzy uh, and wildcard uh, processing and, uh, and query performance there so that uh, you know, these more sophisticated queries to find uh, near uh, match terms, uh, wildcard queries, uh, the performance of these has really gone through the roof. And we'll see a, a graphic that shows uh, a bit about uh, when and uh, how that occurred there. And uh, you know, back to the poll that we had where a number of people are talk, thinking about upgrading from, uh, say, Solar 3 to Solar 4. This very last bullet point here, string to bytes ref, um, this is actually one of the primary points that I uh, make to many people about upgrading. Uh, it, simply upgrading from uh, Solar 3 to Solar 4 gives you uh, this extremely dramatic uh, improved data structure here. It will reduce the amount of memory that your system needs for the same number of documents. Uh, it makes the garbage collection uh, processing uh, much more efficient. There's less garbage to have to collect. Uh, and we'll see a little bit more about uh, what that means in, in just a second. So again, if you're trying to, if you're considering migrating from Solar 3 to Solar 4, uh, just this very last bullet point right here is, it makes it a huge win. Even if you don't uh, need any of the other features, uh, but you just really want to squeeze more uh, documents out of uh, your current hardware uh, and deployment environment. Uh, also at the Lucene level, there's just a number of, these, uh, of uh, great benefits here. The near real-time, the NRT uh, capabilities uh, stem from uh, some improvements at the Lucene level, particularly uh, being able to do soft commits where uh, the, the commits happen faster uh, without F-syncing to the file system, and so you get better visibility. But along with that, the field cache can be controlled uh, to only load on a per segment basis. So uh, this, this affects things like uh, sorting uh, and fastening and function queries at the, at the solar level where uh, when a new document is added, uh, caches need to be warmed that are built off of the field cache. Uh, being able to warm that field cache uh, based off just a few documents being added in a, in a quicker way allows uh, what's called near real time, being able to see those documents much quicker, not just see those documents, but also benefit from, again, from the fasting, sorting, and, and, and function capabilities that drive off of this field cache. Uh, another uh, dramatic improvement here is this documents, uh, document writer per thread uh, feature. This allows uh, much more consistent indexing speed. Uh, it used to be that you had to share a single index writer, um, basically, uh, and uh, funnel everything through that. No matter how many threads that you had, they had to share that same uh, index writer. Now each thread can have its own index writer and uh, write to the index in parallel and concurrently. Uh, we have a doc values feature. This is column stride fields. If you're looking at it from a, a solar level, you can uh, view this as a uh, on disk or an in index representation of uh, basically the field cache. So uh, when this capability is turned on at the solar level, uh, you can benefit from being able to warm uh, the, these caches in a much more uh, efficient and faster way. Uh, we have a direct spell checker uh, that has been wired all the way up through the solar level as well. Uh, this allows you to do spell checking off the main index rather than having a sidecar uh, index that is uh, specifically for spell checking. Uh, this allows you to simply index a document, and now your spell check capability is automatically uh, uh, automatically in place. Whereas in in the past, you had to uh, rebuild the spell check index uh, whenever you did a commit or periodically whenever you wanted to to, to bring it up to date. Um, so that's a big benefit there. Uh, and on the geospatial front, we'll see a little bit more about this later. Uh, it, it, it basically got completely overhauled. And uh, there's a, a whole lot of new capabilities in there in terms of uh, polygon support and, and so on. Again, we'll see a little bit more about that uh, in, a, in a later slide. 
So uh, this goes back to this next slide here, but the bytes ref uh, memory management improvements. This goes back to that string to bytes ref conversion. And this is just uh, you know some uh, empirical data that uh, uh, one of our colleagues, Eric Erickson, uh, also a, a well-known figure in the, the Lucene and Solar community, uh, uh, experimented with this new feature and, and found that, uh, and put these numbers out here, the dramatic difference between uh, Solar 3X and Solar 4 uh, in terms of the number of objects on the heap and uh, the memory reduction that's there. So again, if you're at Solar 3, uh, you will benefit from this capability by just simply moving up to Solar 4 without having to take on any of the other uh, features. So this one's a, this one's a win uh, no matter how you look at it. Um, I'm going to show you a few graphs. Uh, these graphs are from uh, uh, the Lucene benchmark uh, uh, project that's within the, the Lucene code base. And we uh, see here one of the uh, key committers on the Lucene project, Mike McCandless, uh, publishes these benchmarks there. You can go to those URLs and see uh, this. And so every time commits are made to the Lucene project, every time code is changed, uh, these benchmarks get rerun. And you can see here uh, indexing performance. And I believe this one is due primarily to the documents writer per thread, but there's also the pulsing codec and so on there uh, that's there. Um, so, uh, you know, indexing speed, again, I think this one's due to the document writer per thread capability. Uh, big jump there. Uh, on the fuzzy query front, you see a, a, a really dramatic improvement in queries per second throughput on uh, uh, fuzzy queries there. Um, and, and these are just, you know, some basic stats. We, you can go to the, the page again and see uh, the numbers there and, and correlate it with uh, the actual uh, code changes that occurred. Uh, in, in uh, the Lucene and Solar code bases. Okay, so that was Lucene. All of those things that we just learned about Lucene make solar better. Um, solar itself has many capabilities at its own layer there, above and beyond uh, what the Lucene library provides. And I'm just going to run through uh, the bullet list of uh, some of these enhancements here. Uh, we have solar cloud. This is going to be a topic of discussion moving forward, so I'll, I'll defer to that and, uh, and talk about that in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, many new update processors. This is the ability to hook in and uh, manipulate documents as they are being indexed. Uh, you can uh, trim a white space. You can regular expression, replace values, and, and, and these manipulations at the update processor level affect uh, not only the index values, but primarily the stored values that feed into what gets analyzed into the index values. So you can, you know, basically manipulate the documents prior to it hitting the Lucene index. Uh, and there's a, a really nice one called the script update processor, allowing you to, uh, you know, write custom scripts in uh, any language that can sit on the JVM. So JavaScript, JRuby, Jython, Groovy. These languages are all supported out of the box uh, as an update processor. Uh, we have SolarJ streaming response. So if you're asking for a lot of uh, documents or a large response from, uh, from Solar, if you're using the SolarJ library, uh, you can have that response streamed to you rather than waiting for the entire response and then parsing it. Um, we have a content savvy update handler. This is one of my favorites simply because it uses HTTP the way it was meant to be. I can post content into slash update that is uh, JSON or XML or CSV and it will simply be handled based on the content type that comes in on that uh, post request. We have improved document response uh, capabilities with doc transformer uh, allowing you to plug in your implementations to get back uh, information uh, from wherever you'd like to augment the document response uh, within the search results. Uh, there are some built-in capabilities in there with the explain information now being available uh, at, within the document rather than at the end of the response. Uh, you can get the shard back when you're in the solar cloud mode and you have many shards. You can find out what shard that document came from and, and a few other uh, doc transformers that are built in. Uh, you can also get function calculations back on your document. Uh, this is a, a, a big win in the uh, geospace world where you want to get back the distance from uh, the user's specified location uh, as part of the document. In the past, you could kind of do that, but you would lose uh, some refined sorting capabilities because you had to basically use sort to get the distance. Um, whereas 
Uh, now you can get any function value calculation back as part of the document. We have pivot faceting. This is the ability to uh, get facet counts back in, in, in effectively a grid or a tree or a, a in-dimensional uh, um, uh, structure where uh, the facet counts are within one field uh, constrained to another field. And you can do this to n number of fields uh, and get back you know, very sophisticated analytics basically back in terms of your facet counts there. Uh, we have a whole slew of relevancy functions that are now available. Uh, if you want to use uh, any of these relevancy calculations to feed back into the scoring mechanism, uh, now uh, there's many new uh, features there available. That same direct spell checker that was at the leucine level is also wired up to the solar level, as I mentioned before. Uh, we have a pseudo join capability. This is the ability to look at, uh, make a query to one set of documents uh, and get back the basically uh, uh, foreign key, in a sense, uh, value from that and look up another set of documents that match the, uh, that set of foreign keys and return back that second set of documents that match. Um, and you can do that within the same solar core, the same index. You could have different types or even the same type of document that you're cross-correlating there. Um, you can also do it cross-solar core, as long as that other solar core is in the same uh, solar instance, the same JVM, and you can cross over and, and join different cores there. So a pretty uh, nifty feature there uh, that you, you can use to you know, somewhat denormalize, but you also need to be very careful about this feature in that there are some performance constraints there, some limitations. So uh, be sure that uh, you try this out uh, in, in, in real world data situations here. Um, Again, geospatial, we'll defer that to a little bit later with some examples there. Uh, and we have the near real time, I'll talk about that in a minute as well. And we have an improved UI uh, that also will be covered in just a moment. So that summarizes the, you know, the basic features at the solar level uh, that have been improved at the solar 4 version. Next up is solar cloud. Solar cloud is uh, not just a single feature in solar, it is a combination of uh, numerous improvements that have been made um, to allow for uh, a, a robust uh, kind of magical automatic distributed sharded system, a cluster of solar servers uh, that can operate as a effectively a single uh, collection or multiple collections can be hosted in the same solar cloud uh, and it will dynamically scale as you add new nodes. It will uh, put them in the right place uh, within that cluster. Uh, it's reliable in that there's no single point of failure. Uh, as long as you have enough replicas, you know, servers can uh, die and the rest of the system will continue to function. Search results will be served from uh, replicas of the shards that uh, may have gone uh, offline. Uh, some of the features that also benefit, that factor into this are the transaction log um, and um, the near real-time capability. So all of these uh, improvements factor into what we call the solar cloud to allow this cluster to uh, scale uh, dynamically. Um, and I'm going to cover a, a bit more about these features of solar cloud as we move forward here. So solar cloud. Uh, Again, here's the set of the features and the capabilities. We have a transaction log. All updates are added to a transaction log so that you have durability uh, and uh, data will not get lost because it goes straight into the transaction log before it goes into the, the Lucene index, uh, before it goes uh, across to replicate, as we'll see uh, uh, in more examples moving forward. Uh, we have the near real time, soft commits, uh, our new feature allowing you to make updates visible uh, without uh, making necessarily the indexing durable. So you can uh, toss a document into the solar cloud cluster and be able to see that document through searches uh, in a very short amount of time. Again, all things considered in terms of your uh, configuration to make all this work. Uh, and you have hard commit capability 
uh, that make the updates durable. This makes sure that it's flushed, F-synced out to, uh, out to uh, permanent storage uh, into the, the Lucene index on the file system itself. Uh, there's many different ways uh, that the durability works. You can have uh, documents uh, buffered in memory. They can be flushed but not committed and viewable. All of these different states that you can have of the documents. But again, the transaction log ensures that uh, the data is not lost in any of these states. Uh, regardless of whether a node crashes or not, it's written to the transaction log. It will come back to life uh, when that when it's recovered. Um, and so now we're up to the recovery step here. Um, if the transaction log uh, is in a committed state, uh, you know it, it will recover from the transaction log when a node is brought back to life. Um, we also have optimistic locking. Uh, Solar automatically maintains document versioning. There's a special field, underscore version, underscore, where uh, the, uh, an automatic version number is generated. And uh, you have control at update time whether you want to uh, uh, update uh, always or if the version of the document that's coming in is older than the version that you have an index, you can reject that update because a newer version was updated from a, another uh, process perhaps, and so on. So you have actually uh, several modes of control over this, uh, over this versioning and, and the locking of the version. Some of the terminology and, and, and features uh, deeper down in the solar cloud, uh, in, we have leaders and replicas, whereas in the solar 3x world you, you had the ability to scale uh, out in terms of master-slave replication. Um, the solar cloud adds uh, a, a, another layer of coordination through Zookeeper, and we'll see a diagram in, in a bit that shows that. Um, leaders, uh, you, you, you divide your cluster up into shards, uh, depending on what your scale of the number of documents you have or how many shards you actually want to uh, allocate. And uh, as you toss new uh, servers, new instances into uh, the cluster, they will automatically be assigned a, a role, uh, either a replica or a leader, uh, and replicas will be, uh, they, they get assigned to a specific shard, and uh, then replicas, as you add new capacity, uh, just continue to grow, and so you can scale out uh, in terms of document collection size, and you can also scale in terms of number of replicas uh, for uh, you know stronger fault tolerance but also um, for um, for query capacity so that you can um, handle more query throughput um, all of this again is managed by uh, uh, another Apache project called zookeeper um, that spun out of the the Hadoop uh, uh, project and so it's a, it's a substrate that allows uh, a cluster to uh, be managed and, and, uh, and take care of when uh, nodes are up and down and, and, and so on. So the cluster state's all managed through Zookeeper. Um, there is a Solar J, which is the Java library, client library to Solar. Uh, there is a feature in the Solar J library that's used internally, but also your Java projects can leverage this to point at a Zookeeper to automatically discover the nodes in the cluster and, and where to send documents to. So it's a smart client that is cluster aware. Um, and in terms of replication in Solar 4, uh, the, 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 the traditional master-slave uh, uh, capability of Solar is still uh, there. In fact, it is actually a first-class citizen as far as the uh, Solar Cloud world is concerned uh, in terms of it is leveraged when a new node is brought up and it discovers that it should be part of a particular shard, it will inquire with the, uh, the leader and replicate using the, again, the, that same master-slave replication. It will actually just replicate the index uh, from another node that way, put itself in a recovering state, uh, replicate, and then when uh, the, the index is up to date, it will take itself out of recovery mode and say that it's available, and now it's a full functioning uh, member of, of the cluster. 
I just scribbled some things on the whiteboard yesterday, uh, figuring this would be the easiest way to kind of show uh, what I just talked about in bullet points. Uh, here is an example of solar cloud infrastructure where there are three shards, uh, and each one of those shards has a single replica uh, associated with it as well. So there's one liter for each shard and uh, one replica for each shard. If I added another node, it would appear uh, as uh, a replica of the first shard. And if I added a, a second node to this, it would become a, rep uh, a second replica of the second shard and so on. And you just keep adding nodes to the cluster and they just automatically uh, figure out their role, replicate, and, and become functioning members of the cluster. As we index documents into the cloud, um, they can go to any node in the, in the entire cluster. Uh, it doesn't matter wh what the, the first node that they hit. Uh, when it's discovered what the actual shard uh, should be for that particular document, it will get forwarded, if it needs to, uh, to the leader of that uh, shard. And that leader will assign a version number, uh, write it to the transaction log, and uh, then forward it on to the replicas. Okay, and uh, through that process, uh, all happens within that one indexing request. Uh, when you get a successful reply back from that indexing request, you are guaranteed to have had that document indexed on the uh, leader and all of the replicas for the appropriate shard for that document. Um, and so that's kind of the solar cloud magic there. You send a document into the cluster, and it just ends up in the right shard and the right replicas uh, uh, automatically for you. If you need to increase capacity, as I just described, you simply add additional replicas. Also, if a, a node dies and you bring it back to life, it will uh, do its recovery uh, process in terms of either catching up from the transaction log or uh, just doing a full-on replication if, uh, if that's the most efficient manner to bring itself up to date. Uh, so again, very simple and straightforward to add new capacity uh, to uh, the solar cloud infrastructure. All of this comes from, again, from the Zookeeper project. Zookeeper is a, uh, it's a third party, it's not part of Solar per se, it's an Apache project uh, that we incorporate inside of it, and uh, it has its own requirements in terms of making sure that it is fault tolerant. To deploy Zookeeper properly, you need three or more odd number of nodes there to have a, uh, uh, a Zookeeper system that can have a quorum and be sure that the whole coordination of the, of the cluster uh, is in a fault tolerant manner as well. Um, and, th and this substrate handles uh, uh, all of the nodes in there, knowing what roles they are, uh, whether they're up or down, recovering. Uh, the entire infrastructure and management of the cluster is handled through this Zookeeper uh, substrate. And the big picture here, uh, the big data picture that uh, uh, Solar Cloud uh, aspires to uh, and, and succeeds in, in, in many of our production environments uh, already uh, is that you have this magical system that you can continue to toss nodes at, managed by Zookeeper, and, uh, and dynamically scalable uh, uh, in either of the directions that you see there. So you can add new capacity. Uh, in terms of replicas, and we'll see uh, in a bit that uh, a, a new feature that emerged in Solar 401 allows you to also scale out in terms of the number of shards, uh, so that you have dynamic capacity in either direction. Um, next up is the improved administrative interface. I just highlighted a few things in there. Um, to show uh, the solar cloud views and being able to uh, see some of the tools that are available there. Uh, the, the tools there are, are tools that have historically been there, but they've been given a nice facelift. Uh, we have all of these stats um, and uh, nice information about the entire uh, solar node, as well as the solar cloud view. We'll see that in just a moment. But uh, this has been really prettied up from the, uh, the 3x days. Looks really nice. And, uh, and there's a lot of uh, value-added capabilities in here. 
in terms of uh, core administration. You can use the UI to create new cores um, on that particular node. You can reload them. You can swap them, uh, and so on, and, and, and simply unload them if you want. Uh, full management through the UI of, of those solar cores. Uh, solar core, uh, just in case you're not familiar with that, is a, a Lucene index plus the schema plus the configuration. It's the entire single solar uh, index and, and configuration that goes around that. And, and a single solar instance can host many uh, cores. And then above that we have the collection terminology. A collection is uh, spans, uh, could be a span the entire cluster uh, and, and you can have many collections across a cluster. And those would be hosted by solar cores at the individual solar instance levels. Uh, we have a collection view here. So this is just the default out of the box solar uh, 4.x here. And we have collection one. It tells me how many documents I have and, and so on. Uh, a lot of information there. One of the nice tools that we have available in the UI is uh, an analysis view. It allows us to take in arbitrary text and pick a field name or a field type that happens to be in our schema and uh, apply the analysis, both, at, both indexing analysis and query analysis, to break down the, the text into what ultimately becomes index terms in, uh, in the Lucene index. And these are your searchable units. So this is a, a, a great tool for developers to uh, see how the text uh, becomes indexed and searchable. Um, we have here what's called a schema browser. It allows us to pick uh, any of the fields or field types in the index, see what type they are, see their uh, analysis chain, their query uh, analysis chain. Uh, be able to look at uh, some of the stats of the terms that are in there. So you can see uh, the term info there, even a histogram to show you how the, the terms spread out across the counts there, and so on. So a lot of nice introspection that you can do right through this UI. Um, when it comes to the solar cloud world, this is the, the brand new stuff, really shines here. You can look at uh, a tree view of the, the solar cloud cluster. Uh, and here you can see the different configurations in there. So you can have many different configurations uh, published into the cluster uh, management, basically into Zookeeper here. Um, and then you associate a, a, a new core, a new collection with a particular configuration set. Um, and you can see here that I've got one collection, collection one. Uh, that collection one is a, a from my conf, my configuration there. You can see the live nodes there. You can see I've brought up two solar uh, uh, instances. So I now have um, two shards in my index. And there's different views of this. So I can look at the view this way. Uh, and you can imagine uh, if I had a more sophisticated system, there would be many, many more uh, nodes there. You see the shards. You see the replicas. You can click on those nodes and, and go right to its own solar admin view. Uh, of those, because each solar node itself, each solar core, uh, is uh, still basically an independent operating solar. Even though it's part of a cluster, you can look at them individually as well. We have one other view. This one is a, a view that I, I grabbed this picture from online. Basically, somebody's got set up two different collections, and they've got uh, various shards and replicas of each one of those collections. So this is showing you a radial view of a multi-collection set up all within one solar cloud uh, infrastructure. Next up, I'm going to talk uh, uh, briefly about how sharding has been improved. Um, as of um, solar 4.1, we have the ability to uh, route documents to uh, and queries to subsets of shards. Um, and this allows you to do multi-tenancy. Maybe you have different customers that all need to participate, but you only want to you have you want to co-locate all of one customer's information in one uh, shard effectively, and, and rather than spreading it out across many shards. Uh, and this has a lot of benefits. It allows you to scale out horizontally so that you can add new capacity 
uh, to the system by just bringing on new, uh, new shards to the system rather than having a fixed number of shards at startup time. And uh, it also allows you to isolate uh, one or, or a, set, a small set of shards for particular queries. Uh, in the case of you're co-locating many of your customers all in the one cluster, uh, if one customer is doing a query, there's no need to distribute a query request across the entire cluster when you know all of the customer's documents are in a single shard. So you can target that shard at query time and go directly there, saving a lot of distributed uh, uh, operations going on and, and just getting a more efficient and, and faster response there. So this whole uh, routing infrastructure uh, is, a, is a great uh, feature, again, added at, at Solar 4.1 um, at Solar 4.1 time. Um, kind of winding down here towards the end of the bullet list here, um, we've got uh, a number of improvements that have occurred at, uh, a, again, a number of layers here. I'm just going to highlight a couple of these things, uh, particularly uh, geospatial. Again, it got overhauled at the Lucene level, and then the, the solar infrastructure got a comparable overhaul to uh, support all of the, the, the capabilities that, that are there under the covers. And so you can index uh, shapes, arbitrary shapes, circles, polygons, and so on. And then you can do uh, intersecting, intersecting of those shapes uh, with rich queries. Um, so there's uh, you know, sophisticated query language that you can use there uh, for for all this geospatial stuff. And, and of course, you can get back uh, distances between uh, locations, and, and, and you can uh, boost the documents based off of uh, you know, proximity, uh, and, and so on. So many of uh, geospatial uh, features there, and, and big improvements across the board. Uh, the next uh, little section here is going to talk about solar as uh, basically a NoSQL solution. Um, and one of the things uh, that you need in a NoSQL solution is a very fast primary key lookup. And as you can see in this graph here, the primary key lookup uh, capabilities at the Lucene level, and again, I think this one came, some of those steps there came from uh, using the pulsing codec uh, to improve the, the primary key lookup response time. And so, uh, in terms of queries per second here. Um, and so Solar as a NoSQL solution, it needs that primary key lookup there, but it also needs some of these other characteristics. It needs durability. We have the transaction log now. You need real-time get. If I push a document into Solar, even if it's not yet officially committed uh, and searchable because there's caches that need to be warmed up and so on before I can actually perform a, a, a query to get it, I can still, in real time, once the document has been successfully put into the Solar Cloud system, I can get that document right back out using this real-time get. You just give it the unique ID of the document, and you can get it right back out. So no problem there. It'll either come from the transaction log, uh, if it's not available in the index, or it will actually do a search under the covers and pull the document uh, straight from the index. Uh, another characteristic that you need for these NoSQL uh, solutions is versioning and optimistic locking. Uh, as we mentioned before, you get that uh, automatically. Uh, as documents come in, the leader will assign a version. And then as documents uh, updates come in, it will check to make sure that uh, you're not trying to update a document uh, with an older version number than actually is in the system, and, and so on. And again, you have control over that. So if you really do want to completely overwrite documents, you have that choice. You have the flexibility to control how that optimistic locking works. Another feature that you desire out of a NoSQL solution is atomic updates. You have attributes on your documents, and uh, you want to be able to simply tag a document or update a last modified date or uh, in some way modify a document. Um, but you don't want to have to send in the entire contents of that document again. Maybe you're indexing very large uh, text documents. And all you want to do is uh, recategorize the document, put it in a different cap change the category field value for that document. But you don't want to, have to send in that large text again. You can do this using Solar 4's atomic update capability. You can add, remove, change uh, values of fields uh, uh, 
on an independent basis there. Um, you can even uh, increment uh, numeric values um, very easily through the system. Um, and there, there is one co uh, constraint to that in that all of the fields currently must be stored in the index to achieve that. Um, but it, you still do not have to send the full documents over the wire there. So there's a little bit of requirement there, uh, prerequisites, but uh, these atomic updates are a really nice feature benefit as well. Um, again, on the NoSQL uh, front here, um, repeating myself, transaction log, optimistic locking, re redundant, you have the replicas, uh, it's up to you to uh, define how redundant you need it to be, how many of these uh, replicas you need. Again, just fire up new nodes, push them in the cluster, and they're there. Um, distributed and scalable. Uh, we've had people do billions of documents in the solar cloud, so it's totally possible and, and people are doing it. Um, uh, Multi-tenancy, we've had document routing that we talked about, and extremely fast with that pulsing codec and the uh, near real-time capabilities. You can send a single document into a billion document uh, cluster and be able to get that doc find that document in searches in millisecond response time all things co configured uh, and, and so on appropriately, uh, it can be done. Um, and we got the real-time uh, GIF as well. Um, okay, so that you know wraps up the basic presentation here in terms of what's new in Lucene and solar and, and, and why these are important uh, capabilities here. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things looking ahead uh, and then, then we'll kind of go to uh, the, the final slides and, and Q&A. Um, so looking ahead, there's a few uh, very nice features that are coming. We're going to have uh, shard splitting as a feature uh, in one of the upcoming solar releases, um, hopefully the next release, but uh, you know, open source will tell us when, that, when that's going to happen. Uh, that's going to be the ability to, that, that, that's one of the uh, key features in, in uh, being able to rebalance a cluster. You've got a lot of documents across a couple of shards, but you need to add a few more shards because your capacity has grown, your need has grown, and you want to rebalance that. Uh, the, one of the first things that has to happen is you have to be able to split one of those shards into multiple indexes. Um, and then uh, we already have the mechanism to move indexes uh, through replication uh, and the core handlers and so on uh, to other nodes in the cluster. So we, pieces of the puzzle already exist being able to split a shard is, a, is, a, is another piece to that puzzle. Um, and then we'll be able to see uh, you know, automatic shard splitting and rebalancing and so on uh, happen in the, in the solar cloud world. Um, another feature that I think is uh, worth calling out here, um, we've been doing a lot of work internally here with uh, rich uh, query tree control. There's a JSON query parser uh, a patch that's already out there. There's been an XML query parser patch out there. Both of these things um, can evolve into uh, allowing the client to have very rich query control. You already have very sophisticated query parsers that are available, uh, but it can get even better by allowing the client or the server configuration to dictate the, an entire uh, query tree there. And as always, Lucene and Solar are all about performance, scalability, and robustness. It's always going to get better. Um, uh, moving forward. So I just wanted to call that one out too because it's something that's uh, continual uh, you know, on our minds and, and, and in the implementation. It's always going to get better and better. Um, let's see here. Um, here's our uh, slide here. This talks about LucidWorks. Uh, we're in business to support Lucene and Solar. Uh, we have uh, Lucene Work search that, LucidWorks search that it uh, is powered by uh, Lucene and Solar 4. Uh, we've got rich connectors available there. We've got security. We have a LucidWorks Big Data project where a uh, product that has a scalable classification, machine learning, analytics, these types of things, uh, uh, pulling in many open source pieces there that you may already be familiar with and putting them together in a, in a manageable uh, and scalable fashion. And we do consulting and training and so on. So, uh, the full spectrum of uh, uh, things that you can imagine on top of Lucene and Solar. And so now we're at the, the thank you and QA uh, slide here. 
I really appreciate uh, everybody's uh, uh, time today uh, to listen in, and of course for those that are going to be playing it back um, uh, in the recording as well. So I'll uh, let Elizabeth uh, toss some questions my way, and I'll uh, field them the best I can. Um, okay. Okay. So, okay. So we have a lot of questions, and I'm sensitive to everyone's time. So we're gonna we're just gonna keep the webinar open, and we're just gonna keep answering questions as long as uh, as long as we can. Uh, we recognize that some folks will probably need to drop off at the top of the hour because they've given an hour for this webinar. So I'm gonna get started. Um, the first question, Eric: Can we query replica as well as shards? And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, again, every node in a solar cloud cluster is an independent solar instance in and of itself. Uh, so you absolutely can speak to a single uh, node in there, regardless of its role, whether it's a leader or a replica, and make requests right to that. Now, you probably want to go through some infrastructure to look things up in Zookeeper so that you make sure that you get uh, uh, and up uh, node and so on, but you you know if you know the address of a solar server in that in that cloud, you absolutely can go directly to it. Great. Next question: Can Zookeeper be used only in cloud, or can it be used in a setup where we have multiple dedicated physical boxes? Um, the idea with Zookeeper is to manage the cluster in a robust way so that any single uh, node could go down and the cluster is, does not fail. Um, so with Zookeeper set up in the most recommended fashion, you end up having separate boxes uh, for the Zookeeper uh, uh, cluster. You know, for Zookeeper Ensemble is the terminology they use there. Um, and then you need three or more of those so that you have a quorum. So any single node goes down, uh, it still knows the cluster state and, and can adapt there. So um, you absolutely would want to have these things on multiple dedicated boxes. And you can run that on-premise as well as in the cloud, right, Eric? OK, so I guess you know one thing to clarify here uh, you know, maybe maybe unfortunate use of wording here, but the when we say solar cloud, uh, solar cloud really means that it's it's a set of capabilities that allow solar to be deployed in a cluster environment. Uh, that does not imply that it needs to be in the Amazon cloud or the Azure cloud or any of these other cloud computing platforms. It simply means that you have uh, solar has the capability to, to be deployed in a in your own on-premise or in, in uh, basically anywhere you'd like it to deploy um, is basically what Solar Cloud allows. Great. Next question. When some shard dies, should I restart it manually or Zookeeper takes care of it? Um, good question. Uh, if a shard dies, uh, there's nothing, you know, it, it could die because somebody unplugged the machine. There's nothing Zookeeper can do to, you know, magically plug the machine back in. Um, what will happen, though, is that as long as you have enough replicas of a particular shard, uh, you know, queries and indexing all will still uh, flow into the system uh, just fine. Um, and uh, uh, when a machine dies or a shard dies, um, it can it can be gone forever, and you simply could add another machine, and it would basically fill in uh, the gap that was left, and it would again hit recovery mode and replicate and recover from transaction logs and and so on, and uh, and and be fine. But again, there's nothing magically uh, happens that restarts nodes. Uh, that's something you would have to do yourself. But as long as you've scaled things out uh, with the number of replicas there. Uh, you've, you've got a pretty bulletproof system. Great. Can you say a little bit about how to handle schema and or config changes in a solar cloud environment, i.e. how to avoid downtime in a production cloud environment? Oh, uh, and I see the, the asker there. I know Bo. Hello, Bo. Um, let's see. Um, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. Um, and, and the, the answer is actually maybe uh, slightly unsatisfactory here. You know, it's very difficult to, uh, to change a schema. Uh, in fact, it's 
practically impossible to change the schema in some ways and, and uh, be able to uh, you know, continue uh, indexing and querying it without bringing things down and re-indexing and so on. So one of the uh, things that people are doing with Solar Cloud these days is bringing up, if, if you really need that kind of, you know, let's upgrade the system, people are bringing up a parallel cloud, parallel cluster, parallel solar cloud, and uh, with, a, with the revised schema and configuration and indexing into that and then flipping over to it. Um, you know, so there's, there's, at the schema level when it comes to tokenization and so on, that once your text has been tokenized and put it into this inverted index, there's nothing that really kind of magically morphs that and upgrades that index structure uh, with that schema. Um, so uh, with, with any changes that you make. So again, parallel cloud uh, and re-indexing is, you know, the, the easiest answer there. And some changes would really depend on the type, uh, 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 the type of change that you're making. You could add new fields as long as you didn't care that the existing documents didn't have those fields. But uh, when you start changing things at the inverted index level, it requires re-indexing. Okay. Um, this, top, this next question is about query across multiple shards. How do you compute ranking, in particular with non-TFIDF ranking algorithms? Another doozy of a question there. Um, it is a known issue uh, in uh, the solar cloud distributed search mechanism that, T, that that inverse document frequency, the document frequency is not shared across shards. Um, depending on your uh, collection uh, statistics and depending on how you've distributed those documents across the collection, it may have an impact on TFIDF. Uh, rankings or it may kind of be washed out because you've evenly distributed things. Um, not so, you know, if you're doing custom sharding with the new routing capabilities, uh, you know, you may not have the, uh, you, you, you're not necessarily evenly distributing documents based off of kind of a random distribution there. So uh, it, you can suffer from the IDF uh, problem. Um, there are patches that uh, are out there and it is certainly uh, an active area of uh, interest um, in the community to uh, uh, address this, to in some way share index statistics across the shards. Uh, certainly not necessarily in real time, but uh, in, some, in some background mechanism to share these statistics. So it is an issue, but it can be mitigated by doing, uh, you know, even distribution of documents. All right, if I use Solar J, can I discover what shard should I send a query update or should I, or just have to send it to a random shard replica? Uh, with Solar J, using the Cloud Solar Server, you can point it at Zookeeper and it will discover, uh, you know, a, a node to send it to. Um, it still is kind of a, uh, you know, tossing it at random into the cluster and it will get redirected to the right place. Um, uh, but basically that's the idea. You, do, you just toss documents into the cluster. We'll see as uh, this stuff evolves that the client side becomes smarter and, and you could handcraft your client to be you know, m more smart about uh, which nodes it targets there. And with the routing, you do have control over uh, which shards things do go to. Okay, when should you use Solar Cloud versus Master Slave? When should I use Solar Cloud versus Master Slave? That's a good question as well. Uh, Master Slave is great. It's been uh, it's it's uh, been proven uh, in the real world many many times at uh, many big uh, installations. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The Master Slave is about scaling your query throughput uh, without affecting your indexing performance and so on. Um, and having some level of obviously redundancy there and that you've got replicas out there. Um, the negative to the master slave in the, in the big picture is that you have to manage that yourself. If the master goes down, there can be a fair bit of work uh, in some way. It's up to you to figure out what happens. If a master goes down, how do you bring a, a uh, promote uh, a slave up to be a master, how do you catch that up with what got indexed, uh, and so on. So there's a bit of manual work there. 
And solar cloud tends to alleviate that, uh, or does alleviate that concern. Okay, do collection and core mean the same thing? Do collection and core mean the same thing? Uh, no, they do not. Uh, it, it is a bit confusing. It's really hard to kind of describe this whole thing because there are, you know, you have solar instances, solar cores, uh, and you have collections. Uh, the way I view collection, the collection is your entire document set that you want to index. Um, and you're going to spread that collection across many shards. Uh, a shard will have, uh, be, consist of the leaders and replicas, and those individual solar instances have a solar core. So a solar core is the, the smallest working index within the whole solar cloud cluster. So it would be, if, you, if you're using distributed indexing and so on, you've got many shards, it would be one fraction of the entire collection. All right, if we add a unique key with specified shard at the time of index, whether it will route to that shard for index. Um, in, in the default mode of Solar Cloud, the unique ID of the document, the unique key field that you've specified in your schema, uh, is used to hash and determine, uh, based off of the pre-specified number of shards that you've allocated when you started up the cluster, um, it, that unique ID is used to uh, hash to a shard. And basically, it's going to be random. It's going to go to one of the shards, but you can't really tell which one. With the new Solar 4.1 and beyond uh, routing layer, uh, there's a, a capability there. And let me, I'll just back up in the slides just briefly here and, and see if I can get to it. Uh, you dictate which um, uh, the shard key that you use here. So this shard key uh, is a prefix on the unique ID field. And that's, that gives you which shard it should go into or which group of, uh, which, you know, set of shards it should go into, basically. Okay, we're coming up on the top of the hour, and I know some folks are going to need to leave us at this time. So before they do, I just want to remind everyone attending that there are a couple places you can go for more information. Um, the first is searchhub.org, which is a community website um, which is designed to provide answers to a lot of these questions. As a matter of fact, we will be posting, um, posting a lot of these as Q&A onto that site in the near future. The second thing is the annual Lucene Solar Users Conference, which will be in San Diego April 28th, 29th through May 2nd. That's lucenerevolution.org. You can take a look at the agenda and the session abstract and the great lineup of speakers we have there. So let's move on to our next question. We're just going to continue answering questions. Um, there are a lot of them, so we may, not get a, we may not get through all of them before Eric needs to uh, leave for his next meeting, but we'll do the best we can. Next question, what's the difference between real-time get and soft commit? Okay, so uh, a real-time get is the ability to pull a document uh, from the Lucene Index regardless of whether it's actually been committed or not. So it, it will have been written to the transaction log and is immediately available through that mechanism. If the transaction log has been flushed and closed and, and cleared because the documents have been now fully committed in a durable fashion to the Lucene Index, the real-time GET will pull it from the Lucene Index. Um, a soft commit um, makes documents searchable. So uh, you know it, it collaborates with the transaction log, but it's, it's, a, it's a different beast. It basically allows the documents to be uh, visible to search um, and causes the cache warming that goes on to, uh, again, to, for your fastening and your sorting and your function queries and so on, um, it makes it available. And there's a lot more that can be said about that. There's a lot of you know processes that happen with the with the soft commits and the hard commits and uh, real time gets. All very interesting stuff there um, that we'll you know certainly be providing more and more information about. Great. What happens when both leader and replica go out? Ah, well, uh, if both leader and replica go out, then you've got uh, you know you've got a down system basically. Uh, you, you, the nodes that are still up uh, will still be accessible directly 
Uh, but if there is no uh, shard, there's no servers available uh, for a particular shard, then you basically can no longer index, uh, especially if you're doing the, the hashing by ID because it may hash to that particular shard and it can't go in. So you'll certainly get errors on that. Um, in terms of querying, you know, you could still query partially and query the other nodes. They're still, you know, up and running and so on. So you can still access them in the normal solar mechanism. Um, but, you know, this is the whole idea of the whole solar cloud thing is you want to be able, you want to add enough uh, machines that, uh, to, the, to the cluster so that you, you won't suffer that particular situation. Uh, there would be enough redundancy in there that, you know, it would be entirely catastrophic to have um, all of those go out at the same time. Does Solar 4 make any changes to core operations, for example, swapping cores? Uh, good question. I might have to plead a little bit of ignorance on that. Uh, the, the, the core operations are, are still the same. Uh, there is now actually a higher level uh, collection API that allows it to uh, create a collection that will then uh, automatically cause the cluster to create uh, um, cores on other servers. Um, so at, at moving forward, we'll see people using what's called the collection API. Uh, rather than the core API. Under the covers, the collection API, again, this is your entire corpus that spreads across the entire cluster, will make uh, core API calls to the individual nodes in the cluster. Does Solar 4 support global IDS yet? If not, any plan in the near future? Uh, just to address that question, uh, it does not currently address global IDF. Uh, there are patches out there uh, that people have developed. Uh, so there are there are approaches that uh, that are available if you're uh, you know um, not risk adverse and want to play around with uh, the, the the good code base itself. Um, it's something that is a, is basically a to do in the solar community to do that. Does the direct cell checker use only the index on the disk? hard committed data, or does it also use data available after soft commits? It uses the data after soft commits. The, the index is actually written to during a soft commit. Uh, it's just not durably written. It, it, it is available uh, as a full-on Lucene index. It, it's there. It just not has, been, has not been F-synced, uh, so durably flushed to, the, to uh, uh, you know, hard media, basically. So absolutely, a soft commit allows the direct spell checker to uh, still kick in. OK, sending a query to shard 1, will it distribute the load to R2 and R3? And then if another query comes into S1, it might send the query to R2 and maybe S3, distributing the real load? Uh, good question. When, when a queries come in, it's only going to direct the query to one of the replicas for each shard. Um, there's no need to send the query to uh, uh, multiple servers of the same shard because they all have exactly the same data. They're in exactly the same state. Um, so when a query comes in, it will distribute it to the appropriate other shards as well as you know the shard that it's currently on, uh, but only one of those nodes per shard. Okay, uh, this question would like to know whether we can configure a leader by our, by own among shards, among the shards. Uh, another good question. Uh, as I understand it, it is possible to control the roles of the um, of the nodes uh, at a fine grain level when you're uh, dealing with the zookeeper infrastructure. So there is a there, there there's ways that you can. Uh, you know, designate this, this server is always going to be a leader of this shard. Um, that's some pretty low level stuff. I'm not really deep down familiar with that, but as I understand it, that it is absolutely possible to control it at that level. Can Zookeeper run in the same node as Solar? Uh, Zookeeper can run in the same node as Solar. In fact, that's the way I did uh, the screenshots that you saw there. Uh, you can just download Solar. You don't have to install Zookeeper separately. 
uh, and you can bring up solars and solar inside uh, uh, contain zookeeper. Um, it is not, not the recommended way for production systems because you don't want the zookeeper, you want zookeeper separate from your solars for that failover cluster management system. You want that, that management system to be uh, separately managed and uh, a separate failover kind of mode there for each of the, uh, the servers. So definitely production-wise, Zookeeper should be separate ensemble, separate servers, and so on. For development, playing around with, uh, it works out of the box with Zookeeper just fine. All right, how big will a transaction log grow? Oh gosh, uh, I mean, there's no there's no hard limits to that. It's certainly uh, a, a concern. Um, in fact, if you never did hard commits and you kept tossing documents into uh, the solar cloud, the transaction log will basically just continue to grow and grow and grow. And there's actually a memory structure that solar uses to provide pointers into that uh, transaction log so that real-time Git uh, can function. Um, so it's very much uh, recommended uh, to make sure that you're doing uh, regular hard commits so that uh, the transaction log can be cleared and uh, the, the documents are now persisted in the Lucene index fully. So uh, it will just continue to grow and you'll run out of disk space or run out of memory with the, the pointer data structure. So you definitely need to do hard commits regularly. With soft commit, can we roll back? With soft commit, can you roll back? Um, uh, you know, I'm, I have to plead a little bit of ignorance there on the on the rollback uh, capability. Uh, it should work just fine. I mean, it's the it's the same mechanism. The soft commit doesn't change the Lucene semantics, so I'll, I'll answer yes. Uh, uh, rollback does work with soft commits. Is there a plan to write a directory factory in Solar that will read the data from HDFS in Hadoop? Ooh, uh, you know, this is something that's been done uh, and talked about a lot as well. Um, and so, yes, it's, it, I'm sure it's been done. Uh, Performance-wise, I would say it's not a good idea. Uh, there's never been uh, any uh, numbers that I've seen that have shown that uh, you know an HDFS based index data structure is uh, faster or better uh, or more reliable even than uh, than the, the straightforward way that the Lucene uses the you know the fixed media on the system right now. Is it possible to turn off TF or put TF equals zero in ranking documents for face queries? Uh, for phrase queries, uh, you have very, very fine-grained control over uh, what's called the similarity function. So you very much can control uh, the TF factors at, uh, at indexing time and, and, and the factors that are get used at query time as well. So uh, sure, you can, you can certainly do that. Question about atomic update. Does that update the full text index? Yes. So uh, atomic updates, uh, you know, implementation-wise, there's nothing uh, magical about it. It's simply doing, uh, grabbing all of the stored fields from a document in that Lucene index based on the primary key that you're sending in um, and applying the atomic updates that you sent in. You just want to change or modify a single field in that, in that document. It applies those changes to that reconstituted do stored document from disk. Uh, and then effectively just writes it back to the Lucene index. Um, so it's a it's under the covers. It's a delete and re-add of the document. Um, from the outside, you know, it looks uh, it, it looks nice and clean in that it's a, a simple uh, a single field update, for example. Uh, but under the covers, it's doing what you could do yourself. The the benefit there is that they're very large text documents. You're storing the text already because you're using highlighting, for example. Um, you can save yourself having to go back to the original source and sending this, these large documents back over the wire just to tag a document. So you save a lot in terms of bandwidth, in terms of uh, memory, and so on. 
This next question asks whether we can configure a leader by own among the shards. Can you configure a leader? Um, as I said before, um, you can, at a fine grain level, control uh, the role of an individual solar core within a solar cloud cluster um, and you know designate them to be leaders or replicas and so on. So you, you, you can control these things. Uh, generally, that's not something you, you want to do because you want to have um, the thing be you know more dynamic and so on, but you absolutely can control things at that level. Okay, here's another question about soft commits. Are soft commits propagated to replicas? Soft commits are propagated to replicas, yes. All commits are propagated. Next question, does solar cloud do load balancing? Solar cloud does do load balancing. Um, uh, you know, it knows um, of all the um, replicas of a particular shard, and it basically picks out a replica at random to spread when queries come in to direct the you know the actual query to again because it doesn't need to query every replica in a particular shard uh, for a response it just needs to query one of them um, and so and under the covers and and actually you get this benefit out of the uh, solar j clients as well there's load balancing capabilities in there uh, especially in the cloud solar server one um, it, it knows uh, the different uh, shards and will only query one node per shard, basically. As a follow-on question, who plays the role of load balancer, zookeeper or the leader shard? Um, I, I don't even think it's the leader shard. It's, it's, uh, it's the query mechanism built into every uh, solar server there uh, to figure out uh, the load balancing. So it's not Zookeeper itself. Uh, Zookeeper provides the cluster state. That cluster state is uh, available at every individual node, and so in, internal that node without inquiring with Zookeeper uh, for every request, it, it knows which ones to go to. What's the fastest way to index 50 million documents in Solar 4? We are using Data Import Handler at the moment, which is quite slow. Um, good question. I mean, the data import handler itself, uh, you know, it's, it, it, there, does, there is a multi-threaded capability in the data import handler. Uh, however, it's not necessarily the, the, the fastest or, or easiest way to get the data in. Um, you can write your own process to uh, index the data. Um, there are, um, you know, as, as long as you're parallelizing the indexing and making sure that you're, uh, you know, pushing each solar uh, node to its maximum capacity, uh, you'll be maximizing the indexing throughput there. Um, so uh, it may be that there's other tunings that could be done on that 50 million document uh, import there. There may be uh, something about the settings on the JDBC driver and so on. Sometimes that can have an effect uh, as well. So we'd have to look at that individual case there. Is the solar test framework being updated to align with the solar cloud changes? Hmm. Uh, absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the interesting things about the whole solar cloud development, and uh, one of the reasons it's actually uh, quite robust, uh, even in the 4.0 release, um, uh, which is a brand new release with this whole giant new code base, um, is that uh, under the covers of solar development is this, this uh, very intense test suite. As the solar cloud features were being developed, uh, the developers uh, created uh, a test infrastructure and leveraged uh, some some uh, best practices that kind of came to light from from Netflix. In fact, where uh, they've got many distributed servers and they they employ this thing called the Chaos Monkey, which is basically a process that runs around their cloud, their cluster, and just kills nodes at random in their production environment just to make sure that everything is okay in terms of the whole cluster and the whole system still being able to adapt. So this chaos monkey concept was applied to the Solar's test suite. Um, and so there's an extremely robust test suite that runs Solar Cloud, uh, brings up many nodes, uh, indexes documents into a control node, uh, indexes uh, doc the same set of documents into the, a Solar Cloud cluster, 
and uh, at random kills uh, different nodes and so on and asserts that the control node and the cluster are still matching. So uh, yes, there's a, a, a very intense test suite there that is up to date with Solar Cloud. If I have two servers, one is a leader and one a replica, and if all queries go to the leader, how does it decide which cores answer the query? If all queries go to a leader, um, well, that, if all queries go into a single node, it's still going to have to distribute those requests uh, to other uh, nodes in the cluster, other shards, and the, sh the, the, um, the other shards that it requests to, it's going to pick basically any of the, the leader or replica uh, of any of those shards basically at random to, to redirect the request to as well. Um, and at query time, you know, there's really no difference between a leader and a replica. That's really for the versioning and the uh, indexing capability. But, you know, in terms of the, their role in the whole cluster at query time, they're all basically equal. Can I update synonym.txt without restarting the solar server? Uh, you can. Um, however, the infrastructure to reload that synonyms file, there's two things that you need to do. One, you do need to reload that core. You don't have to bring solar down per se, but the, the, the current synonym filter uh, only reads that file on core reload or restart. Um, now, whether you need to re-index or not, that's really dependent on whether the synonyms uh, for the particular fields you're using it with are uh, index time synonym filtering or uh, query time synonym filtering. So if it's uh, query time synonym filtering, if you update the file, you still need to basically reload the core to get those synonyms picked up by the system, uh, but you do not have to re-index. But if they're index time synonyms, of course you have to re-index as well. Is there a way to query multiple collections and provide one merged result set? Um, yes. Um, the caveat there is that anytime you are distributing solar requests to uh, separate nodes, uh, to separate cores, they must be the same schema. I mean, that's the, the kind of the hard line there. They must be compatible schemas or the same fields and so on. But, you know, pretty much they should be the same schema, uh, all things considered. Um, is, is how, you know, we generally recommend that. And, you know, the, the, distributed, okay, the distributed search mechanism in solar is, uh, has been there uh, for many versions in the past. So solar has had distributed search. That same distributed search mechanism underlying it all is exactly what's used in solar cloud as well. And you can, you know, it, you could distribute the request to other solar servers that have uh, disparate sets of data in it, but again, as long as they have the same schema, uh, you can distribute requests to it. So we answered this in a different question, right? Oops. Sorry, I just put us on mute. Can I affect and PF I IDF influence on ranking at a query level? Can you use TF-IDF influence at query level? Uh, more or less, yes. And, uh, you know, this boils back down to the relevancy functions uh, that were added. You, you have uh, uh, an incredible control over uh, the scoring mechanism uh, within Solar, thanks to its function query support, um, uh, with all kinds of crazy things. So you can get the term frequency, the term freak, uh, you know, some of them are the, the raw term frequency or it's the computed uh, factor that corresponds to the term frequency. You can get to the document frequency or compute the IDF. All of these factors you can control at query time uh, as well uh, in, in, in within the function query mechanism. Solar Cloud replication is also more timely since it uses a push model as opposed to a master-slave pull model, right? That is true in that you send one document in at a time uh, and it will replicate to all of the, the replicas uh, basically in real time for that. So 
Uh, certainly the indexing characteristics of solar cloud versus a single solar node um, changes and, you know, whether it's slower or not, you know, it's really going to depend on what you're trying to do. And if you're doing large, large batch indexing uh, in a solar cloud world, uh, one of the recommendations there is to bring up the leaders of all the shards, no replicas, do your batch indexing, and then bring the replicas online to uh, use the, the straightforward replication mechanism there. Uh, that way, you're at batch indexing time. You're not incurring that, you know, per document uh, replication going on. When you unload a collection, will it unload from all replicas as well? When you unload a collection, um, I believe that is true. The using the collection API distributes across the cluster, and you know, in a cluster-aware way. Which solar feature can I use to pull and pick XML message from a queue and add it as a document to the solar index? Hmm. Well, you know, there's lots of ways to, uh, to solve this type of problem. Um, you know, if you've got a queue mechanism and there's XML messages on the queue, uh, you can simply put push arbitrary XML to solar and have a server-side XSL convert that into Solar's representation, or my better recommendation would be that you're, you have on your queue basically sitting somewhere uh, something that dequeues items uh, using maybe the Solar J or some other Solar API to write to the Solar uh, server in its own uh, Solar XML or Solar J or Solar Bin uh, or, or the Solar JSON, any of those formats, basically something that dequeues and then writes to Solar. There are multiple ways to index documents, post.jar, update, and data import handler. Is there a recommended or preferred method for Solar 4? Um, there is not. Again, there's just so many ways to get data in. And there's, uh, you know, the, you, can, you can push documents into Solar through JSON, XML, CSV. Uh, there's a Java bin format that the Solar J library uses. Um, uh, if you're indexing rich documents, there's a, yet another handler that can do that. Uh, so I, 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 there's so many variables to that, and, and it really depends on the, the, the project, the application, and, and the needs there on, on what would be the best way to get data in uh, to Solar, or have Solar pull it through what's called the data import handler. What are the main issues with migrating from Solar 3 to 4.1 if we have our own custom sharding routing Sharding slash routing, query syntax, etc. Um, well, that's a that's a tough one. I, you know, you certainly have to evaluate uh, exactly what's going on there. But the, you know, you can go to Solar 4.1 without using what's called Solar Cloud, uh, and simply use it uh, in the same mechanism that you're using now with the basically your own sharding and using built-in distributed search that Solar's had for a while. So uh, that would be the first step. Of course, by simply going to Solar 4X, Solar 4.1, you'd be able to, uh, um, you know, benefit from the memory savings and all these other things. Um, the custom routing stuff, you'd have to look deeper in the, under the covers of that to figure out if, if it made sense to go to Solar Cloud and have a custom router that would route to the sharding mechanism that you're already using. But I, I think that would be possible. You'd have to augment the... The, the thing is, you'd have to, you'd still have to re-index because the, you, to use the custom routing, you need that shard key identifier in your unique IDs. Does transaction log slow down indexing? Uh, I do not think it's a, a giant impact there. Um, so you know, I think there is some some effect there because it is writing it. Um, now the transaction log itself is not f-synced on every uh, uh, item, so it's actually faster to write the transaction log, but it's not implicitly uh, durable. There is a configuration uh, uh, change there where you can make it f-sync, and that will have a, a bigger impact on the indexing performance because it's, you know, it's f-syncing the uh, transaction log every time a document comes in. 
what is a shard? Can you please give a quick overview of how a large index should be split into shards? A shard is simply a subset of the documents of your collection. Um, if you have a large number of documents, uh, let's, let's just use a round number, let's say 10 million documents, um, and that's not even really necessarily large, uh, but for the sake of argument, let's say we want to uh, break that into two shards. Um, so you simply bring up uh, two solar instances connected to the same zookeeper infrastructure uh, as a cluster and uh, start indexing documents and they'll automatically distribute between those two shards. When you make queries uh, to that cluster, you'll see all 10 million documents um, that will distribute the query requests across both uh, shards. Now you could isolate and look at one shard at a time, but by default everything kind of distributes automatically in the solar cloud mode. Hopefully that during, a segment, oh, during a segment merge, are updates to the index still blocked, i.e. calls to update handler hang and until the merge completes? Hmm. Uh, the merges happen in the background, so it does not block uh, updates. Okay. In what way has highlighting improved from Solar 3 to Solar 4.1? Can you please be specific? Oh, gosh, I'm getting pinned down on that one. Um, you know, I did not create that bullet point on the uh, agenda. Uh, I stepped in to do this webinar uh, without crafting the, uh, the agenda. The highlighting bullet point that's on there, uh, I kind of question that as well. Um, there, there are improvements in terms of just underlying uh, in term vectors and, and uh, storage uh, that are there. Uh, in the Lucene 4X line, and in fact, I think in Lucene 4.2, term vectors are now compressed, so you get better performance there, um, and, 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 and space savings. Um, there's also the fast vector highlighter, uh, but that came in uh, Solar 3X time frame. I'm not sure exactly what version. So, you know, the highlighter probably hasn't really changed that much between 3X and 4X. Okay, this is going to be our last question because we're now 30 minutes over and I know uh, Eric needs to get on with his day. Um, can we upgrade from solar 4.2 to solar 4.x with, with shutting down solar and no re, I think that's supposed to be without shutting down solar and with no re-indexing? Uh, in theory, yes. I believe uh, you should be able to do that. Uh, you know, all the 4Xs, uh, it is by uh, convention and by design of the community to uh, make them all backwards compatible. So if you upgrade from uh, 4.1 to 4.2, uh, you should simply be put the new version in and, and uh, without re-indexing or anything. You certainly have to bring the nodes down and back up, and there's nothing going to magically make that upgrade happen that way. But um, you shouldn't have to change your configuration or your um, uh, or your index. It should just work. Um, you know. That being said, always a good idea to read the change log uh, for the versions. There will be uh, you know any important information uh, logged into that change log. So by all means, read that stuff and heed any of the, the uh, warnings and best practices and tips and tricks that are there. Okay, we still have a ton of unanswered questions, so we will do our best to follow up with you um, individually to answer, answer the questions that we didn't have time for during today's Q&A session. This is also the first in a series of webinars regarding Solar 4 and solar features in, in general. Um, since you've attended this one, we'll be sending you an invitation to the next one, as well as publishing a schedule in the search hub of the topics that will be coming. We thank you very much for your participation today, and we look forward to having you join us on our next webinar. Thanks, everybody. And are you still there, Elizabeth? 
I'm still here. I'm you here. are the Terminator. You're great. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna turn this off and then I'll call you directly and uh, and we'll connect. Okay. Very good. Okay. Bye bye.